Kneeling in front of the downed alien, Adam pondered his options. He couldn't just leave her here. It would result in another group of militiamen finding her and doing the exact same thing he just put a stop to. Taking her back to his hole would be equally bad, but for him instead of her. He'd have to move everything and find a new hole to stay in, and he didn't like that idea. But he, and by extension the attractive alien in front of him, didn't really have any options. Pulling out a roll of gauze and a bandage from his belt mounted IFAK, he set about stuffing and bandaging the wound she had suffered. In the grand scheme of things, taking what he believed were 50 cal rounds to the chest and leg with as little damage as they had made was impressive. It spoke volumes that Shulvanti armor slowed the rounds down just enough to prevent extensive tumbling and other kinetic damage. As he finished wrapping a bandage around her, no longer heavily bleeding leg, she was watching with a confused but hopeful gaze. It had taken her off guard when he didn't immediately try to kill her, and instead had begun to apply aid. Why are you doing this? Helping me? She asked in shill. You are clearly an insurgent, and if you think that I'm going to talk because of torture, you're just another foolish male. She started, with some heat in her tone. Well, you're just another purple idiot if you think I'd go for all of that just to torture you. Adam replied, probing the admittedly shallow depths of the shill he knew and feeling a little angry that she was treating him like any other militiaman. After all, he'd just done for her. And frankly, I don't like that tone. I could have just left you to your fate, but here we are anyway. Satisfied with his medical work, Adam gave her a once-over and confirmed there were no other injuries besides a few light scrapes and a massive wound to her pride. He then moved to several of the militiamen and searched their carriers. Finding the expected battery of 5.56, 0.308 and 7.62 by 39 rounds that were the most common among the militiamen. He stuffed them into his pack and moved on to a man in a plate carrier, battle belt and bomb helmet with night vision. This man was probably ex-special forces, or at least was geared like it. He snatched the night vision and then began to remove the magazines from his plate carrier, only to hit jackpot. The army had begun to use a new round before the perp invasion, the M855A1. It had a solid copper jacket with a tall steel penetrator tip, a powder load that only just avoided exceeding the limits of the 5.56 round, and a crimped primer. Shortly after the invasion, special operations found that the special composite that the shell used for just about everything happened to be decent at maintaining shape enough to punch through shell armour. Although it only really worked out of an 8 inch or longer barrel from less than 50 metres, it could easily zip through a shell suit and cause enough damage to be troublesome. The 855A2 round, as it became known, was only produced in small batches and only able to be disseminated to tier 1 troops before everything fell apart. The vast majority of the remaining rounds were either shot or seized by the Shul government who banned it almost immediately and very few people owned any. Adam had just so happened to stumble upon a crate that fell out of a crashing AC-130 gunship and managed to haul it home. During his militia days it was his dirty secret. It was how he managed to single-handedly kill 27 perks with rifle fire from close range over the years. And this guy had a whole house of the stuff in magazines and battle packs in his rucksack. Greedily exchanging the magazines he slipped into his rucksack from the fallen militiamen for the ones loaded with the 855A2, he got up and walked back to where the admittedly gorgeous woman was watching him pensively from. Listen, he said, his knowledge of shield starting to come back from his militia days. You don't want to stay here, and I have somewhere we can go until you can get, uh, uh... He had forgotten the shield word for exfiltration, or he had just never learned it. Until you can get your friends to come and get you. It will give you a couple days to rest, some food in your belly, and a cool story to tell the girls when you get back. The Shul weren't an exclusively female race, but they had a significantly higher ratio of women in their society versus men compared to humanity. At least that what he could glean from terminals and stations they had raided, along with the fact that women tended to be around 7 feet tall on average, with males coming in at just under 6 feet. He had yet to see a Shulvanti male though, but he blamed that on all their frontline soldiers being female. He also knew that the Shil... The women, at least, were insatiably horny, much like many of the infantrymen he knew were. More than a few men accosted by drunk Shulvanti inside of Greenzos could attest to that. Whether or not they'd taken the beautiful aliens up on the offer was a different story entirely. It could get you labelled as a perp lover or a traitor, and you'd be in as much, if not more risk, than one of the Imperial Marines on a patrol for a red zone. Which brought his thoughts back to exactly what he was doing. He was going to have to move after this, regardless of taking her back to his place, after wiping out a militia squad and clearly branding himself a traitor to the militia, if not humanity at this point. Fine, she said, trying and failing at levering herself up to a standing position. 
Just get me out of here, and I won't have you flop for only an illegal weapon. He rolled his eyes at her clear attempt to posture, even as she struggled to get to her feet. Listen, I would like us to get along, but you making threats like that just convinces me more and more that I should put you out of your misery here and now, he said, only a glare from the wound. Then he extended his hand to her, and levered her to her feet with an arm around his shoulder. She was barely taller than him, by only a couple of inches. Sending a six foot six himself, he reasoned that six foot eight inches was still within the normal range for a shell. You're tall, she said, with a small smile for me as she looked at him from her position on his shoulder. I'm not used to males looking me in the eye. Oh, great. She's delirious. You're not the first person to tell me that, believe it or not, he said sarcastically, as he began the slow trek back to his hole in the mountain. He couldn't risk taking their truck as much as he desperately wanted to. First of all, because he didn't have a place to stash it, and secondly, because he didn't know if it was why for independent detonation, a tactic that had been used by human resistance groups since the Shulvanti invasion. The shield would capture a rebel vehicle, take it back to base, and then it would detonate, taking anyone nearby with it. He mentioned after a few missed radio check-ins, that's exactly what would happen. Walking, or limping as it were, at a brisk pace back to his home, Adam flinched slightly as the now couple thousand meter distant truck in fact did detonate. He shook his head and continued the last few hundred yards to his humble abode. He helped the now very clearly delirious from blood loss alien soldier into his bed, removed her bandages and began to take off her armor to begin to inspect and treat her wounds. The one in her abdomen appeared to have missed anything vital and had stopped bleeding before he started. He sutured the wound closed on both sides and the move to the leg wound. This was more difficult, and he thought he might have nicked an artery from the amount of blood loss she had suffered, despite the suit's attempts to put pressure on the wound. She was passed out on his bed now, and as he used an old surgeon's kit he had stolen from the medical tent on his retirement from the militia, he did his best to staunch the blood loss, bandaged it up, and let it heal on its own. He wasn't a medic by any means, and hoped she'd make it out alive. Why, though? He pondered while washing his hands. She's an Imperial who'd probably shoot me dead if she called me in the city. Why do I want her to live? Shaking off his thoughts, he began to prepare dinner for himself. After he ate, he headed back outside to find the sky turning red, and moved to disguise the blood trail that had led straight here. He returned to the scene of the battle and was relieved to see that reinforcements had not indeed arrived yet. He began to brush over the trail of blood and cleared any evidence that he had been there in the first place. They'd certainly be confused, no doubt, but probably just assumed the shield had stolen the human weapon and killed the man. Or at least, that's what he'd hoped. Making his way back well after dark, Adam was unsurprised to find his house guest snoring away in his bed, thankfully alive. If she was asleep for more than a couple of days, he'd need to find a way to get nutrients into her, and that was not a proposition he liked. He sucked as a medic, but that's why he always avoided having to do anything medical, if he could during his military days. Sighing, he pulled his bedroll from under his rucksack, grabbed a blanket and a pillow from the bed, and found a cosy corner of the cave that he had made his home. Sleep took him shortly after that. Waking up early the next morning, Adam found the woman alive and still fast asleep. He had put a spare one of his shirts on her after bandaging her wound the night before and piled her armor off in one of the recesses of the cave. His cave was small as houses went, probably only a thousand square feet, but that was more than enough for a camp stove, a small stockpile of canned food, ammunition and several guns. The bowl was indent into the walls that held his bed, or really a pile of blankets with several pillows, and a small electric powered light running outside to a solar panel that was disguised into the rock face near the entrance provided the only real light in the place besides a small trickle of ambient light from the tunnel entrance. He went about his day like normal, just with the addition of checking and changing the large one's bandages. He made breakfast, briefly left to check his small game snares, and returned with a rabbit which he skinned and threw the viscera well beyond his cave. Returning to the woman in the mid-afternoon, he checked her bandages and tucked her in. She was pretty, a lighter shade of almost blue as opposed to the usual purple that the aliens were. She had a small smattering of freckles across her face, the small tusks that were a hallmark of her people, black hair that extended just past her shoulders, and a feminine physique. She was incredibly attractive, and looked to be in her early twenties, but aliens might age differently than humans, he supposed. Leaving her to the extended nap she was taking, he returned to the rabbit he had snared and skinned. He diced the meat up quickly and put it in a pot with water, some beans, potatoes and some garlic. Stowing the stew absentmindedly, he decided to leave the cave and check the site from the battle yesterday. He could see it, if just barely from the cave entrance. Grabbing his spotting scope, he meandered out the front and looked down at the site. 
militiamen and trucks swarmed in, in a way that the Shuvanti ships in orbit would probably notice, given the missing soldier in the area. It was a shit operation by all accounts, and these men seemed like they had some training, but not nearly enough. He doubted they would find him, but the various traps around his cave would alert him to trouble. Toe poppers, cans with strings, and even a punji pit that took entirely too long to dig out of the soil, which was more like dirt mixed with granite pieces. He returned back inside his cave and found something rather surprising. His house guest had woken up and was leaned up against the cave wall at the head of the bed, staring decidedly at the pot of stew. She then seemed to notice him and smirked. I should have known that your first thought as a male was to cook me dinner, she said, looking back to the pot. And I should have known that you'd be a bitch even for a pub. Who even says this for you? He replied with a chuckle, moving to grab the two balls from the stash corner, even as he spoke. She crossed her arms across her admittedly large chest and winced, eliciting a chuckle from Adam. She then eyeballed the stash of several firearms and several thousand rounds of ammunition next to a small teapo stand which held his battle belt, plate carrier, and a bump helmet with jewel tube night vision affixed to his crown. Empress tits, you've got quite the collection there. What would happen if it fell into my reporter headquarters? He asked, sounding half serious. Well, he said, as he caught his head contemplatively. You'd probably get the man who pulled your ass from a certain death executed for being a dissident, but I doubt that matters much to you. Now here, he said, bending down and handing her a bowl of the stew. Eat up before I change my mind, miss, he said, shooting her a questioning look. Sergeant. Meritorious Sergeant Frulia Gresson, she stated. Well, Sergeant, he stated, stressing Sergeant sarcastically. How about you tell me how exactly I should get you home? 